It's great to see you all, and hopefully, <coughs> Lanny's is always so interesting, and he's right about Noggle. He was really one of the more important people, and we rarely talk about him, as we rarely talk about Barbara Heinemann Lantman. And last fall, I started doing going back to translation, and uh, I found myself focusing more attention on Barbara Heinemann Lantman, and. I think it's because when we look at the total number of testimonies that we have translated, we really have the fewest number done by her. Even She didn't give as many as Rock, I understand, but she was an inspired website for many years. So it's kind of surprising to me that we don't have more of hers done. And I guess I'll have to remedy that. <laughs> so. Uh, but then I thought, well, why, why is it? And probably it's, what is with this light here? Probably it's because most of them are a little too harsh. They're more harsh than some of those, the, the other ones. We think perhaps they contain too much criticism of individuals. And so I think we shy away from them a little more because we're looking for some more universal Christian message. The metaphors she uses aren't quite as picturesque. There's not, they're not as pretty. I mean, you often run into snakes in there, and you often run into nests of vipers and different things that aren't that pleasant. And so therefore, you'd rather have somebody refer to something a little more pleasant. So I'm not starting her off very well, am I? I'm sorry. But, but, uh, you know, then all of a sudden we have all the stories that people told, our great grandmothers and our great grandmothers told stories about her, and they weren't always so great. And so therefore we've had kind of a, I'm trying to get over this, and so <laughs> I'm going to find that. Maybe the greatest reason for not translating more of Heinemann's testimonies is because we have heard, and we can certainly read, that she wasn't very well educated. In fact, when she first came to the community in 1817, she couldn't read or write. She was poor and in need of support, both physical and spiritual support. She was a challenge. Okay, all of that's true and probably accounts for the fact that we, yeah, I don't know. Can you hear me or not? Yeah, I'm just trying to get it back oh, up there, yeah. The fact that we have so few of her testimonies translated. So then, why now I have I recently come to believe that she was absolutely vital to the community, both at the time of its reawakening in 1817 and to this church's continuation to this very day. During the last almost 50 years, I've been translating our church's history, our testimonies, and some of our more important documents. In fact, what got me started doing that was a series of talks very much like this. Uh, we were planning, I was just a whatever, how old young mother and going to church regularly, and my brother Glenn asked me to do a study on the Werkzeichen, and uh, I thought, well, that I can do that. That sounds like a college assignment, and I'll figure it out as I go along. But what I hadn't figured on was that I'd become so intrigued by it that it would become something that I wanted to do for a very long time. In fact, even now, I often think I really didn't complete the assignment that Glenn gave me. And also, uh, another consideration was the fact that after World War II, and that's when I was in college, German wasn't really taught, and it wasn't really encouraged even, nor did anybody show any interest in it. And so all our history was in German, and so therefore I was a little bit uh, stunned by that. And while I had learned in Sunday school on some Sundays, not even every week, once in a while we would read in German. I really didn't, I really, I knew how to speak 
our colony Deutsch, but I did not know how to read it. So it took a little doing. But with some determination, I got it done. I gave the talk and almost unknowingly became completely absorbed with learning about our history. I don't know what this light is all about. I can't see. Okay. Here, let's try this way. Yeah, I think it should be higher or something. How does that work? Well, okay. See, I have this trouble. Okay. There you go. No, no. Right there is where it should be. Right there. That's okay. No. <laughs> no, just see if you can do this. Ah. ah. Perfect. Oh, perfect, yeah. Okay. Good. Wait. I have, I have worked, I worked on this as much as I possibly could during the 50 years and always with great and unfailing interest. My children can attest to that. I remember Fred coming home one day and said, what did Kempf do today? They had heard so much about that stuff from years ago that it, it just seemed like something that I did. Uh, my favorite website to translate always before and maybe even still is Johann Friedrich Rock. But I love them all, especially Johann Adam Gruber. And Gruber has the most exciting testimonies, maybe. Ursula Meyer is in a category all by herself, and we have the Himmlische Abendschein translation that is interesting and, and current. And all of her testimonies are still current. It seems like they're no longer just something that happened years ago. They become very real. They're clear and they're timely. The importance of Christian Metz cannot be overestimated. Maybe it's because this, his time as a Werkzeug and the number of testimonies he presented greatly exceeds that of anyone else. I also think he might be considered our most important leader because the time of his leadership includes leaving Europe, coming to the New World, and establishing not one, but two communities. But when considering them all, I can absolutely say that despite having translated her biography, which Emily pointed out in the Blue Book, and I did that, I don't know when, in the 80s, I think, I have given Barbara Heinemann Landmann the least attention of all. So I suppose that's the main reason I've been thinking about her more. So let's talk about her a little bit. In 1817, 68 years after the death of Johann Friedrich Rock, the great Werkzeug and leader of the community in Europe in the 1700s, the community of true inspiration had all but vanished. And that's the time that Lanny was talking about. He's, uh, Paul Giesebart Nagel brought them together, but it was a difficult task. And at that, due to time, war, and lack of leadership is probably because these congregations were spread throughout Europe and leadership was not always present in all of them. So they had to be visited is what Nagel did. And the once relevant Christian separatist congregations of our church's forefathers were virtually non-existent. A few members surviving persecution clung together in small groups in various places in Germany, France, and Switzerland. They still had some of the old inspirationist books, the Psalterspiel, a few Sammlungen, and so on. In 1815, it was to one such small group that a friend sent a young woman named Barbara. After the textile mill where she worked closed due to war, and let me tell you, she worked in that text textile mill from the time she was nine years old until she was 18, and then it closed. Her father, she came from a very poor family. I think her mother had died years ago, and her father was uh, not that well-to-do, so Barbara went to work and then the mill closed. Barb, then she left and moved to Sulz, where she worked as a servant girl at an inn. Here, while staying up at night, waiting for the mail coach to come, to come so she could serve food to the driver of the coach, 
she spent her time thinking. At first, her thoughts revolved around the fact of how fortunate she was for having this wonderful opportunity and job and everything was going her way. And all of a sudden, she began to think deeper. And she began to think, what am I here for? What am I doing? And she began to question her upbringing and her faith or lack of it. And all of those things became something she thought about. Uh, so this was near Strasbourg in an area that was either French or German, depending on who won the last war. And at this particular time, <coughs> Strasbourg was German. Now, as you know, it's French. Because Barbara had become a very intense young woman who questioned her life, her faith, and her religious training, or lack thereof, friends told her she sounded like a pietist and said she should go and speak to some older women in the town who were known as pietists. She did, and that is how Barbara Heinemann Lantmann, well, let's not use the Lantmann yet, just Barbara Heinemann's life as a member of the community of true inspiration began. After I first read the account of her life, as she in her later years told it to Gottlieb Shiner, and then he recorded it and it's printed, translated and printed in there, our church's great historian, I thought, what a story. This is our Joan of Arc. Here is a young woman who in an earlier century might have been burned at the stake. I translated that biography in 1995. It's printed in this book. And after that, I went on to translate other things, but nothing about Heinemann for the next 28 years, until recently, as I said. And now the series of talks allows me to share a few newly found formed thoughts with you. As we read in the Bible over and over again, God chooses many. No, God employs many and varied individuals in his work. Here in Barbara Heinemann, we have our own example of that fact. She could neither read nor write, had no money, no connections, and threw herself completely upon God's mercy and care. So what did she have? She had courage, a great sense of adventure, complete and unwavering trust, Plus, she had the main ingredient, the main requirement, which is to leave all that you have and follow him. And actually, we had a service about that very thing this morning in church. And so it was quite poignant. She became one of God's instruments or tools because she went to these people first in Sulz to talk pietism, and then she actually went to the Ronneberg, where the remnants of the society were beginning to reform and, and Christian, or at that time Michael Krauser was there, and she went there. She delivered then, after she became inspired, she delivered his word to the people and let the chips, as we say, fall where they may. While this got her into trouble, both with the people she spoke to and also with the law, she nevertheless obeyed. She completely disregarded the fact that she lived in a time and a place where free speech and freedom of religion did not exist and ignored perhaps the most important fact that she was a woman and that women were not exactly encouraged to speak out especially not in church. Above all, she willingly ignored the fact that if you did not conform to the beliefs of the leadership of the land, the province in which you lived, you were arrested and jailed. So that is what happened to her countless times she was jailed. Once after an arrest, no, that doesn't help. Once after an arrest, when called to testify along with other inspirationist community members, she was asked to swear an oath. She said, no. The judge said, you have to. And she said she didn't have to because Jesus forbade it. She pulled out a new testimony 
and read them Matthew chapter 5, verses 34 to 36. By now, she had taught herself to read using the Bible as her textbook. The authorities talked it over, and because they couldn't dispute what the Bible said, the courtroom officials caved and said she could answer with just a yes or a no, as scripture stated. So in a country, on a continent, actually in a world where freedom of religion was not yet a right, she fought for and was given that right, at least for that moment. She had dreams and visions about what was to happen, and often this foreknowledge helped her. You know what? Let's turn the lights on. Can we do that? helped her avert difficulty. She endured constant criticism from both within and without the community, but she didn't waver. Rather, she continued doing what she interpreted as the Lord's will. In those early years of the reawakening of our faith, Barbara Heinemann was a mainstay among the young leaders of the Ronneberg, a group which first included Michael Krauser, but beside then Christian Metz. Her energetic participation was so very important. But besides all that, I have come to realize that she was a magnet for most of the blame the authorities cast on this radical religious group. Because she was not from the Ronneberg area, the authorities considered her the outside influence that was the cause of all this upheaval and withdrawal from the accepted church. She became a target, and so the authorities pursued her to the point of arrest and even imprisonment, and she spent many a night in prison. As a result, more freedom was given to the other young leaders like William Marshall and Christian Metz. Who knew? Well, now we do, and we can find it all in this book. Well, now wait a minute, I have a book. Side here's a beha. Beha was this. Here, up there. Oh, have you got it there? Yeah. That was you mean? No. No. Okie dokie. The, the little German one. This one? Yeah, the little. Okay. This was, this contains her. Oh, that one, right there. Okay. This little book contains her uh, first testimonies and then also contains her, her biography and starts with the 24 rules. The reason they included that, even though it was given, the 24 rules were given in 1716, they chose to reprint them in this because they had been newly rediscovered. They had been not really seen, or, or I guess not lost, but not used for many years. So they chose to print, reprint them in here and use them as the foundation of the new awakened community. And uh, it's, and then also an interesting, the first testimonies that she gave, we don't have, they were burned. And this was because there were several members of the congregation who weren't sure that she was truly inspired by God and therefore decided that, okay, if she truly is inspired, she can start all over again. And so they burned them, and uh, that's they start in this book then in 1820, which she had been inspired before then. But like I say, they were not, they were not, and maybe that was the way to look at it. I mean, if God wanted them, he and he did. He re-inspired her, and it it worked out. She let's see now that was she would visit the new and growing congregations around the Ronneberg area. She led prayer meetings and presenting testimonies whenever she became inspired to do so. And there's one testimony that was given June 29, wait a minute, I have it, June 29, 1819, and it's mostly to, well, it's 1821. It says, Dear Young Hearts, it's, this is just a paragraph, so it's to the youth, and this was an important thing. She herself, by now, was only like 21. And so this appealed to the young people. Be ever on guard against thoughtlessness and carelessness. Second, when overcome by fear and frustration, 
with which everyone is overcome from time to time, remember that my holy angels are always with you. They see your actions and know your thoughts. They are my angels, but they are also yours, and your well-being is their pleasure. And I thought, what a beautiful, comforting message that must have been for the young people who were listening and, and for that period of time. Then in the summer of 1823, after five or six years in the Lord's service, and after a particularly difficult time of persecution, she lost the gift. Barbara Heinemann lost the gift of inspiration for the next 26 years. She didn't speak out in 26 years. Why? Well, she became weary of wandering the narrow mm -hmm. spiritual path is what it says in the history. She had no actual home, no family, and she was physically and mentally exhausted. So she left the community, married George Lantman, as she had wanted to do the previous year. George Lantman was a teacher in the inspirationist community in Bishweiler, and now they together left and lived on their own. After a short while, they both returned to the community at Ronneberg, and afterwards, long afterwards, in 1842, when everyone left Germany to come to America, they came too. They first settled in Ebenezer, then in Homestead, and in 1849, the Lord chose her once again to speak out his word. This, in her own words, is what she said to Gottlieb Scheiner years later when he was writing her biography, quote, Yes, the eternally faithful Lord and Savior who recovers the fallen and the lost would not allow me to stay along, to stray along my own path. Rather, he pursued me and searched for that which was lost. He led me through a long and difficult struggle of repentance which I am unable to describe. And then, to his great, in his great love, grace, and compassion, he set me aright. In the year 1849, after almost 26 years, he raised me from my fall, and in my unworthiness, took me to his service, in which I, through his grace and mercy, to this very day on which I state this, still stand. Praise be his holy name. Amen. End quote. In the year 1849, in Ebenezer, New York, through one of the, this inspired testimonies, Christian Metz learned of the soon to come reinstatement of Barbara Heinemann, Lundmann, as an inspired website. Brother Christian was very pleased about this because he had always felt that her leadership was important and that she had not been given the support she deserved at the time of her downfall. Now, after being served, after having served alone for such a long time, he welcomed the help that she gave. Until her death in 1883, Barbara Lantman worked very hard through her gift of inspiration to achieve a united and productive community. She, she traveled from one village to another, first in New York and then in Iowa, attending important meetings and doing her best to unite the people in their, serv in their service to one another and to the Lord. The following is a translated paragraph from Christian Metz's diary about that time in 1849. Because we do not often read what it was like to be a servant of the Lord, chosen to declare his word, to deliver his word, I want you to hear Brother Christian's words he wrote. Sister Barbara Lundman has now, after the Lord has given her the promise, spoken out twice in inspiration. The first was here in a funeral service, and the second in, up in, in Upper Ebenezer, during the last Undersuchung. On both occasions, the words were very uneasily issued, though through her, and from my observation, 
a more profound spiritual rebirth must occur within her. The most cert this most certainly will mean a complete self-surrender and total commitment on Sister Lantman's part before God's gracious light, power, and word can break through. For it is indeed true that such is not acquired by desire or seeking, nor by work and exertion. It is born out of the anguish and, and only possible by hurling oneself into and losing oneself in the depths of the unfathomable. God must propel us through fear and in the deep and in our deep anxiety we are flung into the darkness of faith. Our self-will must be completely negated. This has been and still is my experience. I have often been overwhelmed by a feeling of helplessness. Then out of the depths of despair came forth the most beautiful and most meaningful issuance of God's grace. My soul has been truly astounded at the accomplishment at the inexplicable ways and works of God. It is no simple matter to, the, to, God's, to be God's instrument in whom the, not, the pure spirit of inspiration can exist. I have often discovered that God's grace is hindered by subtle self-love and personal thought, but through surrender of myself, grace, grace in, in accordance with God's holy will is enabled to create a new it goes on like that. So it's quite an interesting thing because, like I say, we don't often read how the Rexite himself or herself feels about that, and we certainly can't know from just thinking about it. So this is one, his opinion. This is the only place I have found Christian Metz to express himself as clearly as this, most on this most unknowable subject. Christian Metz died in 1867, and he lies buried in the cemetery up here in Amana. And Barbara Heinemann continued speaking out until her death in 1883, and not as frequently as Metz, but regularly. You can find her testimonies in the Metz Sammlungen. They are numbered individual, or hers are numbered his are numbered all the way through chronologically in the years, and hers are also numbered separately. So when you see some numbers that are out of place, that's a Barbara Lundman was identified too, but I mean, that's how they did it. And then after Metz died, the two books that are printed afterwards contain only her testimonies. For 16 years after Brother Christian's death, she delivered inspired words to help, no, to help keep, on, well, now I'm just, to help unite the congregation and calm the many conflicting opinions that arise within any group. As we know, a man is great change from communalism to independent capitalism was to come in 1932, less than 50 years after Barbara Lundman's death. We also know that communalism was not an actual part of the community's history, as we learned that too in the last few times when we listened to this, but there was nothing said. In fact, I sometimes wonder, on the boat trip over here, the four gentlemen that came to look for land through Brother Christian's inspiration and through their conversations decided to become a communal society. And I often thought how overwhelming that would have been for the people back in Germany who signed up for it, and all of a sudden now, the terms were quite a bit different. <laughs> and, and they willingly did this, which was a sacrifice. When you say follow him, that was, they all made that sacrifice. It was never intended to last forever. For some time, dissatisfaction had existed within the community for the community's method of government, but, and this says, and this intensified with Brother Christian's death. But I believe 
that though through her leadership, Barbara Heinemann Lundman can be credited with delaying that decision. Then, when the decision to end communalism actually came in 1932, it could be and was handled reasonably and well. I'm finishing up. Many people have made the mistake of repeating, reporting or believing that communalism failed in a manner. No, it did not. If you learn anything today, know that that's true because of that, the papers after, the, after communalism ended here, the headlines declared communalism or communism, they called it then before the Russians had it, what failed in a manner. Well, it didn't. And, and you know, that just has to be clear. It did not fail. It lasted and worked for 89 years. All those important things during the establishment of the Ebenezer Settlement in New York and the Amana community in Iowa. Think about it. Because of this share and share alike way of thinking, this community could welcome the necessary talented people that were needed, the farmers, the carpenters, the bricklayers, the stonemasons, everybody that maybe wouldn't have joined because they didn't have the funds to do so or because they weren't inclined, now had a place to go and they could actually be brought over here and be part of a community and they didn't have to fend for themselves. And I think that is part of our, what we now call the success of that community at that time. The people that Christian met through his ability to organize things was able to attract. And we, we, we cannot forget about that. So all that is why I have come to believe Barbara Heinemann Lantman is much more important than our history, in our history, than we have up until now allowed her to be. I plan on carefully going through the testimony she presented and pick out and translate those that might help us in our Christian life today. Thank you so much.